So we go on to a much awaited speaker, Dr. Samresh Srivastav, who's a, a senior consultant or a, a managing director of Raghudeep Eye Hospital, Ahmedabad, cataract, cataract and refractive surgeon. And he's going to talk on a very interesting topic, dysphotopsia management. It is not a too common a problem, but it can be a very bothersome patient if you do not know how to handle this situation. On so I'm going to be discussing about dysphotopsia. And dysphotopsia is not an exclusive diagnosis, but it includes probably all the uh, <clears throat> you know bad uh, visual phenomenon that patients have uh, when they come to us post-operatively. Despite doing whatever surgery we do and despite using the best of equipment and the best of IOLs, it's not uncommon to see dissatisfied patients. Uh, it's it's not uh, it's not like you see them every day, but when they are there, it's a six by six patient which is unhappy, which is exactly what Dr. Ramamurthy sir was saying. Uh, you know, you have to figure out what's causing the bother. This photopsia uh, has been defined as an optical phenomenon uh, that happens in patients who have undergone cataract surgery with an IOL, and it reduces the quality of vision. Uh, they've, it's been grossly uh, classified as positive, which means photic phenomenon like flashes and glare and halos and negative dysphotopsia, which essentially means some sort of a shadow, which a lot of patients will complain, a temporal shadow that they see immediately post-operative that lasts them for some time. Uh, positive dysphotopsias are far more common. Uh, and we, I guess we've, uh, we already understand and you know, the reasons why it happens most of the time, things like halo, star, burst, uh, glare, and a combination of either of these can be there in any IOL uh, that is implanted, especially in the first few weeks. Uh, glare is a subjective discomfort uh, that you can, I mean, it's, it's probably one of the most common symptoms that is over there. And uh, it generally happens in patients uh, post cataract surgery who've had, who have larger mesopic pupils or scotopic pupils, which again is uh, not very common in, uh, in our subcontinent because of uh, our pigmented iris. But if it's there, a good idea would be to put them on some sort of medication that brings down their pupil. Uh, something like a brimonidine uh, would normally help in eyes like this. Uh, starburst uh, is again linear lights that are there around the point source. Uh, I have no cataract, but I see starburst if I focus on headlights, particularly when I'm driving at a highway. So I'm guessing a lot of these patients will complain of starburst because they, they're seeing light after a long time, after a long haul of cataract. And uh, because for some reason, patients want to look at the headlights after a cataract surgery, which they would never otherwise look on a routine day-to-day uh, -day lifestyle, but they tend to try and you know challenge their uh, lenses. Sometimes starburst can also be due to, uh, starburst like this can also be due to astigmatism, residual astigmatism as low as half a diopter can sometimes create a starburst-like image in these patients. If the, if the problem is uh, residual astigmatism, even if it's a light diopter, there is no ego in not prescribing them these lens, uh, these uh, refraction, and I would go ahead and give them a light correction, particularly in challenging situations like night driving. Flare is another version of uh, positive dysphotopsia where uh, you know you see a light that is around the object, which can, which is basically could be a combination of a starburst coma and a little bit of cylinder can also play a role. But anything like a starburst or a cylinder, you can give a glass with maybe a tint or a night driving glass cylinder correction of, like I said, of even lower uh, magnitudes can give a significant benefit to the patient and uh, can help us pinpoint the diagnosis and give them a right solution. Problem is if an IOL is decentered. So if, a de if the lens is decentered, what you get on a manifest refraction is a cylinder, but what you get on an aberrometry is a coma. And coma is something that you can never really treat at a spectacle plane. <laughs> These will be a little more challenging as patients. So if it's a decentered IOL early on, maybe you could do something about the IOL and try to bring it back in place, which I doubt it will, because if it's decentered in the first place, it's going to most likely decenter again. And this can be a little more challenging uh, in terms of positive dysphotopsias. Negative dysphotopsia, uh, the most common form of negative dysphotopsia is a sort of a shadow that is seen in the temporal part of uh, the patient's vision with most surgeries being temporal clear corneal. It could be due to corneal edema in the initial phases and it tends to resolve over a period of three to six weeks as the uh, incision seals off. But sometimes it can persist for longer time durations and that is it is attributed to many things like an IOL uh, with a high thick lens, larger nasal capsular excess cover, 
uh, like Dr. Ramamurthy sir brought about a square edged optic and a larger pupil size amongst all. Again, it has been defined as a temporal darkness and a lot of uh, these depictions will be available. Patients normally say that they feel that something is there on the side and a lot of times you would dilate to check patients if the retina is getting detached of all, but it's just classical. Now, uh, with a few patients, one understands that it is temporal dysphotopsia. It tends to go away when you look in the direction of the dysphotopsia and it tends to get worse when you look in the opposite direction. Uh, again, like we discussed, square edge optics are uh, known to cause uh, more dysphotopsias because of the design of the lens, which we just briefly discussed. And there have been a lot of studies, one by one published in JCRS some time back, shows that uh, it's the material, the design of the lens, and the asymmetric uh, design that can sometimes cause it. And uh, it also concluded that it's a good idea to uh, have a 360 degree similar symmetrical overlap over the end of the anterior capsule. Uh, which can help in preventing dysphotopsias. And if you do have a dysphotopsia, the myotic therapy may be useful. So with a square edge design, there is a lot of, uh, because, because it's a sharp edge, square edge is an excellent uh, design, one of the breakthroughs in IOL technology to prevent posterior capsular opacification. But at the same time, you know, there's a trade-off and it sometimes in patients where the light would fall at the edge, it gets reflected back into a crescentic problem, giving can give you dysphotopsias. So I'm just going to discuss briefly a case uh, that happens, uh, you know, dysphotopsias can happen in, under any circumstance to even the best of surgeons. I think the most important thing to understand, to take, uh, you know, in, to understand over years of experience that is there on the panel here today is that listening to the patient is half the problem solved. If you, if you consider, if you listen to the patient and accept the problem and, you know, acknowledge that there is a problem, then the patient is more, most often very accepting to it. There's no point in being defensive and saying, no, no, everything is good and lens is in place and you should just disregard it. Uh, when in doubt, it is best to wait it out and repeated counseling is always best because the one tool that we have in our hand, which is given by God is neuroadaptation. So if you give enough time, you settle down with pretty much all the problems. The good news is it tends to resolve in most patients between three to six months. So there's no rush to jump into any sort of surgery or a YAG procedure. But it's very, very important also to be very careful in the other eye and to learn from your experience with the first eye and try to come up with the reason why the patient is having dyspotopsia. So this is just one case I'm going to discuss that we did in our clinic of a 62-year-old female patient who's had a good cataract surgery done elsewhere and has a pretty pretty good technical outcome if you call talk in terms of technical outcomes. Uh, good hydrophobic IOL implanted in the bag. But the patient is extremely bothered with negative dysphotopsia, so much so that it decided to jump ship and come to our clinic for a surgery. Uh, so the questions that were in our mind is, what should we do now with this patient? Uh, going through literature, this publication from uh, Dr. Sam Masket shows that you know you can you can uh, eliminate dysphotopsia or you can reduce it in the other eye when the optic is laid over the anterior capsule or by or rather by doing a reverse optic capture of the eye. This was a very interesting uh, read. So we decided that we are going to attempt a reverse optic capture in this patient. What is reverse optic capture? You put an IOL in the bag, but you slip out the optics above the anterior capsule. So the haptic stays in the bag and the optics are in the anterior capsule. Again, we would understand a three-piece lens would be a more suitable design. But because our uh, we counseled this patient, uh, we decided to uh, go ahead and uh, we told the patient that the dysphotopsia might still be persistent because it's a problem with their eye and the patient decided to go ahead. Uh, Pre-operative screening revealed an astigmatism of 1.75 and so we shifted and decided to put a single piece lens because we wanted to treat the astigmatism because we didn't want that to become another deterrent in the patient's visual outcome. When doing a rexus, it's important, particularly so if you're planning an optic capture or a reverse capture, is to get the right sizing and for about a 5, 5.5 millimeter, if you can, would be a good size. So it's best to take all the time to make sure that you have a nice symmetrical capsular axis because the rexus will define the centration of the IOL as well, since you're going to uh, capture the optic. So this is us taking all the time to create a good, good regular sized capsular axis. Cataract surgery is uh, unremarkable, uh, but there goes a toric IOL in the capsular bag. Uh, another good uh, takeaway point is whenever you plan to do anything, any procedure that involves a little bit of manipulation, it's always good to have a good lens which has, uh, you know, all the properties of intraoperative maneuverability and the comfort of being able to plant it in the right place and to be able to play with it. Uh, once the lens is in the bag, we remove the viscoelastic uh, from behind the cap, behind the lens and dial the lens into its right axis. As you can see, it correlates with the topography uh, kept up there. 
Once the lens is in the right axis, we now slip the optic. If you know, notice the distal optic is being slipped out uh, over the anterior capsule and then the proximal optic. So it's good to take all the time possible and go slow. Uh, good materials will, even if you dent these lenses while you're doing it, this, it sort of bounces back on its place and these, these dents are not prominent on the eye. It's important to make sure that the entire optic as much as possible is slipped out so the lens locks it to place. And that's exactly what we're doing over here. And for this is followed by a residual viscoelastic removal. Notice that the axis is right, the axis where it's intended to be. And this is uh, this is a classical reverse optic capture with an intact posterior capsule. Uh, this is patient at post-op six months, patient's happy, six by six, IOP is maintained. Uh, the UVM shows the IOL is well fixated and it's not rubbing against the uh, iris as well. And the rexus margins are totally fused. So this patient's unlikely to develop a posterior capsule opacification as well. OCT is being followed up and uh, the retinal surgeon is obviously uh, commenting on this and it stays unremarkable. And the uh, same patient that one year follow up is doing extremely well. So just to conclude, uh, in our hands, reverse optic capture worked uh, beautifully. Uh, it's a useful tool, particularly when we're doing the other eye in a patient who's already had uh, a negative dysphotopsia. But like Dr. Ramamurthy said, brought about in an eye which already has a lens and has a dysphotopsia, maybe that brilliant idea of putting a sulcoflex lens of half a diopter may also save your day in that eye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Samresh. That uh, uh, was a very clear, crisp picture of uh, dysphotopsia. I would want uh, the opinion of the experts in the panel uh, Dr. Bhaiwal Savada, Dr. Suchi, anyone, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, like, since this doesn't seem to be one way of dealing with negative dysphotopsia, so what do you all feel? Reverse optic capture is the solution. Like, as he said, if you've had a negative dysphotopsia in one eye, have all of us uh, thought or would we go back now and think of doing uh, dealing with the second eye with a reverse optic capture, even if it's a toric IOL implant? Yes, Kamal. Uh, one thing I've probably started doing for last three, four years is that I make sure that the haptic optic junction is within zero to 30 degrees temporarily. And there is an overlay of the haptic coming from the side. And I've been reading a lot of literature on this and uh, it seems to work. In fact, all my colleagues in sharp sight now i've asked all of them to do that and to my surprise i i don't think we are seeing many dysphotopsias now so i think it it probably works to a large extent your optic haptic what did you say the junction of the optic and haptics is supposed to be kept within 30 degrees and there has to be an overlay of the haptic going across in the bag on the temporal side uh, what zero, to, work, zero, to zero to 180 degrees. Zero to 180 degrees. Zero to 180, but you see, I've seen till 30 degrees also, sometimes the lens may rotate. It works great. So, because yes. it uh, it's blocks that the rays Absolutely. on the nasal side. Yes. The aberrant light rays which are coming in, because even on the opposite side, there is a haptic layer. It blocks the total internal reflection from a square edge. And then yes. again, there is a optic haptic junction. So there's no perfect square edge at any point on these sides. So then again, the <laughs> optic, uh, placing the uh, IUL horizontally, uh, orientation yes. haptic horizontally is definitely better than positioning it vertically. Yes, yes. Dr. Sandeep? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make one comment, you know, that uh, what Kamal said is very good, but that would work mainly in non-toric IULs. Of what, course. What about with the rule astigmatism? where you're going to keep the lens at around, uh, you know, 90 to 70. So it's only the, against the rule or the non-toric that, you know, you can have that of course, flexibility. Of course. I just want to make one comment about uh, this talk which Samresh gave. You know, haven't all of us seen that it rarely happens that the negative dysphotopsia occurs bilaterally? Samresh, I don't know what's your opinion. I generally find it is one of the eyes. More so in the left eye, sir. More so in, in the, the left, left eye. eye. Mostly in the left eye. More so, so in the left do, eye. Correct. So if I were to do the right eye of such a patient, I would go ahead and do a normal procedure. And then if there is a negative dysphotopsia in the immediate post-op period, what Samresh has described is a beautiful idea. You can do it in the immediate post-op period also. Just capture the optic and, uh, you know, if the issue gets sorted out, it would be excellent. Uh, um, I don't know what is the opinion of the house about this. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Abhay has something to add. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think there is a wonderful article coming up in March issue of iWorld by Jack Holliday, 
Holiday and, and Nicole Farm. Please read that on negative dyspotopsia, various options. But if I have to do the second eye of the first eye having negative, I would simply try to do a larger rexis. What is important is that if you have too much of an overlap of the anterior capsule, that sort of thing will occur. And I concur with uh, uh, you know, my friend that horizontal is the one that uh, gives less. That's Kevin Miller's theory, which is uh, the publication by somebody later on that placing horizontal reduces, it, but it doesn't guarantee that it will not happen. But, but it's a good idea and, and, and come alive, I do the same. Uh, so I think that's a great point you made it. But but remember, if you have other eye, do a large rex is simple, because yes. reverse capturing single piece uh, sometimes in some anatomy can produce iris rub and then produce a comfort. So be careful about it. Uh, if you have the board, there's nothing wrong as you saw. But but be be cautious. I yeah, think I will exchange uh, is uh, not a solution for intractable dysphotopsia from what we understand from the talk now that uh, as uh, if it's early on you can do a reverse optic capture and if it is late on like Dr. Amuti said you could place a piggyback lens of a plano par uh, so these would be the ways I don't think we need to look for doing an IOL exchange in any of these cases right. yes Ramuti, you were saying something no, I just want to second what uh, Sandeep said in the sense that, you know, very often you find that uh, the dysphotopsia, negative dysphotopsia is complained the patient in one eye alone. That particular case that I uh, showed where I put in a piggyback lens where the primary surgery had been done elsewhere with an excellent toric implant. And just because he is uh, negative dysphotopsia went away, he came to me for the second eye surgery. And since he needed a toric intraoc lens, the thought of uh, creating a, uh, a negative uh, reverse optic capture came to my mind, but I went ahead and did a conventional surgery. And the patient had uh, no negative dysphotopsia in the second eye. So it's not that uh, most often we get it bilaterally. The patients often complain in one eye alone. And uh, uh, somebody just a I, question. I mean, can I add something? Uh, yeah. I have experience of three, four cases of the monofocal lenses which uh, six six vision and one eye is was having very uh, this photopsia and eye trace they show aberration internal aberration so uh, that is because probably some capsular fibrosis there was slight tilt in the monofocal lenses and we just rotated that monofocal lenses and the complaint was resolved uh, yes dr kamal uh, you see, uh, as uh, uh, I as uh, I have just heard the previous speaker speak, I do agree. Uh, I've had uh, I I I can show some videos where I've operated a patient. It's just one and a half months down the line, and all I've done is just rotated the lens front and back, broken some adhesions, and maybe there was a slight capture of the capsule somewhere. It broke loose, and it has worked. So I've done this in two cases, yeah. no, no optic capture, nothing, just broken the adhesions of the lens. The lens is still in the bag, but I could see there was slight kind of adhesion more so at one end of the anterior posterior capsule, just slightly pushing the lens or probably tilting it. And the Tracy did say something. So all I did, so I agree. I, what I did was just put some viscoelastic from two side ports and just and, move the and lens, rotate, rotate, yes. break the adhesions and, and it, it disappeared. I have done in four cases and all are result. Uh, uh, before we go on to the next speaker, there's one point which was uh, uh, not uh, covered. Of course, dysphotopsia doesn't uh, need not uh, talk on this. But uh, what I wanted to know is what were your views on uh, the, with the improvement in the multifocal IOL designs with a larger optic? Uh, are we any of us still strict with the angle alpha component? Or would that be covered by Dr. Naren Shetty in his talk? Mm -hmm. The answer is, madam, we have to largely started uh, not looking at angle alphas anymore. And uh, unless and until, you know, uh, there is a, a big outlier, which I would put my eye on that data, but I don't pay too much attention to angle alphas, but particularly with the uh, the newer panoptics and the PBT lenses, I don't really look at that. Yes. Um, uh, yes. I mean, and, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yeah, definitely, ma'am. I think, uh, see the th chances of that happening or having a large angle alpha is extremely extremely rare that is why a lot of practices happen without doing it and they still you know 99 percent of the cases everything is perfect it's just that one person rarely which occurs uh, then you can land in, in a soup but with edof lenses are much 
more, uh, you know, forgiving, you know, even larger uh, angle kappa, they still, okay, they still do well. So, 